There we go. That's us. All right, so uh, full room. Thank you all for coming. Um, it is exceptionally bright in here for this time of the morning. We, uh, we're more night owls. We're out. These, these don't usually get going till about 10 o'clock in the day, so uh, our day doesn't start till not long before that. We can get out and start checking and we, and we work well into the night. So this is, uh, we're still just uh, firing up, so bear with us. But um, we're very happy to be here today and, and talk to you a little bit about what we do. And so we'll, uh, we'll start off with um, basically how, how it, how it, uh, who we are, what we do, how it came to be. And so yeah, as, as we are Melbourne City Rooftop Honey, um, we are a project um, where we literally um, deploy beehives in the CBD and surrounding suburbs, ideally on rooftops and unutilised spaces. Uh, and, and the idea behind it basically was um, to, um, to bring bees back to the city, to raise awareness of problems of bees around the world, to connect people with their food. Uh, <coughs> um, yeah. We also wanted to... Um, yeah, you said connect people um, to their food, but also bring a little bit back of, I suppose, nature back into the city and connecting us who also live in these spaces because it's one of those things that if you live and work in the city, you might not, also, you not, might, might not necessarily get to have those opportunities. And rooftops is one of those things that we thought was um, a space which could be utilised and I don't want to go in too much because I'm going to flip over into chant stuff. <laughs> okay, so we weren't always beekeepers. Originally, we both had IT backgrounds. Uh, I had a small business looking after network support for, for other small businesses. Vanessa was more project management and desktop publishing. And that project management background is actually quite good for helping keep me organised. So it gets worked <laughs> out quite well. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, how did we then get into it, um, which is, it's, it's an interesting journey basically, from living in a suburban block in Heidelberg where we live, um, we're on about 650 square metres, and started uh, questioning where our food was coming from and what was happening to it along the way, um, what, was, what was really in our food. So we, uh, we built a raised bed veggie patch in our backyard. Yeah, there we go. So yeah, we built a raised bed veggie patch in our backyard to start with in one back corner. <coughs> Started to produce some of our own food that was going into our kitchen, being eaten, you know, uh, within, within hours of it being picked, basically. <coughs> and uh, from there we uh, started looking at the rest of the yard, going, oh, there's a bit of lawn, like, what's the point of grass just sitting there? So <laughs> started digging up more and more sections of lawn. We put in a... Uh, a five metre by three metre uh, hothouse to start propagating seeds and things like that. And then we were looking at what else could we do. Um, we, were, we were looking at chickens, Vanessa always wanted chickens, um, and we, we raised the idea of bees as well. And I thought that bees would be much more thrilling than chickens. <laughs> so <laughs> we went and did ourselves a, uh, a bee course at our, our most local bee club that we could find in Doncaster. And when we did the, so, so our journey was actually really positive. We did our bee course, uh, we got quite excited, instantly wanted bees. Uh, we, we, we 
spoke to the swarm collector in the club and said, oh, we want to come and collect a swarm and get some bees at home. And he goes, all right, put your name on the list. I'll let you know when I get, it, get the next swarm. And we said, no, 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 we want to come and collect it. So this, uh, he was about 70 at the time, 70 year old Austrian man was so excited that we actually wanted to come with him to collect a swarm. But, but he, he was, yeah, re like really quite excited. And he called us and we were at the ready. We went out with him and we were both a little bit shocked to see a 70 year old man up a wooden extension ladder climbing up into a tree to collect a swarm. And Vanessa and I looking at him going, we better give this dude a hand. Like, he's gonna hurt himself. So, so from collecting our first swarm, our, our first colony was created at home and they were beautiful gentle bees and so we fell in love with bees. Along the, our journey we also found a mentor which was our swarm collector and still is today our, our bee mentor which is an, a, an excellent um, thing to have in, in your bee journey is, is having a, a good mentor basically who can teach you because there is a so much knowledge that is only learnt from hands-on experience that, that needs to be passed on. Then from uh, having our hive at home, our skills grew with, with our colony as it grew, <coughs> which is, is also something now that we recommend with our beekeeper, is that you get a small colony and, and you grow with it. But basically at the club we noticed, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of the most polite way to put it, but it was an ageist crowd. There were a lot of hearing aids in the room and there were a lot of old, it was men in the room. And Vanessa and I looked around and were, were concerned, saying that, that beekeeping is a, a vital skill. It's a, it's a craft and a vital skill that needs to be passed on to the next generation. So that also helped with us wanting to do something more for bees, thinking that, you know, these guys have got a wealth of knowledge, it needs to be passed on and people need to, to start looking at, at what they're doing. <coughs> So basically from there, we had our hives at home. We, were, we, we had tended, we had a hive, we were tending to it. It split into two hives, because it, it grew so large, we thought we would split it. And uh, one of the common stories with beekeepers is they, they try and limit themselves to how many hives they'll have. They say, oh, I'm just gonna have one in the corner, that turns into two, which turns into four, and that's, that's the beekeeping journey. <laughs> so we were enjoying it, and with our addiction to bees, we started, learning more about them and their struggle worldwide. Started noticing, so when you're interested in something, you see articles coming up everywhere, bees. You know, <laughs> bees are in the world, what's going on? You start noticing things and you start reading them with, to be perfectly honest, I was incredibly naive as to how important they were in the food chain uh, and, and what they actually do and, and their struggle in the rest of the world. We grow up in Australia, generally, taking for granted what bees do here. They don't suffer any of the, the problems that they do in the rest of the world. And so even to the point where I didn't think about it, and it, it is logical now that I do, but some people still believe bees make honey for humans. <laughs> and like, you know, I, 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 of course I know now that that's not true, it's their food for winter, but people just don't, haven't thought about it to, to even consider why they would make it. People, some people think that there's actually a tap on the side of the beehive and that we just open it up and the honey comes out. <laughs> I think some people have, I think there's been too much of the bee movie watching going on or something. But um, one of the things for me, I'm very passionate about gardening and that was initial my, my I suppose, journey towards bees um, because I really love growing my own food. Uh, and I like cooking from scratch as well. And I started to feel probably about five or six years ago now that I wasn't quite sure, I didn't trust where my food was coming from or the chain, I didn't understand where and which along the lines, you know, who was involved and all that kind of stuff. And so that's why I kind of started doing this. And one of the, one of the mornings after we'd, we'd started our journey on beekeeping and um, as Matt said, you know, one hive becomes two and three and four, it becomes highly addictive like tattoos. Once you get one, you have to get more. Um, and for us, it was one of those things where I felt like I needed to support my garden and pollination. Um, honey was kind of cool and nice because everybody, most people like honey. 
But um, for me, it was just the whole chain. And one morning I woke up and said to Matt, I've got to do more for the bees and we have to take the bees to the city. Which is an odd thing to wake up to. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been thinking about this and I've been thinking that, um, what about if we took bees into town and put them on roof spaces and we created a little bit of, well, awareness for the bees as well as creating a true local food source for some of the businesses that live in, you know, that reside in the city and, and want to have something, you know, that's a local and low food miles. So um, I woke up that morning and said that to Matt and I said to him, this could be big. I know it, I know it, I can feel it, something's going to be huge. And then I got onto Google and thought, hey, nobody's done this before. <laughs> but, uh, you know, other countries around the world have been doing it for hundreds of years. <laughs> um, places like the famous bees at the Paris Opera House and the, um, the UK people and in London they love their bees and beekeeping as well and then the New York beekeepers as well who were fairly rene renegade um, running around the town because in New York it was illegal for many years so uh, yeah I really thought that I'd come up with something really unique and different <laughs> But I didn't, and everything is everything that has been. Yeah, well, our ideas that we come up with, in some way, in some way, it's been done before in history. So, um, so we uh, thought we'll still give it a go. <laughs> it should work. Melbourne's a pretty good city. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. So, <clears throat> we had some friends who were chefs, and we uh, we spoke to them and said. We, we wouldn't mind speaking to the owner of the restaurant. We've got a bit of an idea. Um, it's going to be you know, pretty cool. They, they should be into it. So we organised to sit down with um, two owners in particular of two different restaurants. And both of them, so they basically gave us the same sort of response when we said, we've got an idea. We're going to bring a box of 50,000 bees, put it on your roof, um, and we're going to try and like do good for the bees and you might get a bit of honey that goes into the kitchen. Both of them said, um, I don't think that's a good idea for a restaurant and with the people eating here. And so um, we, we, we convinced them and said, no, it's not a problem. They do their own thing. We'll look after them. And it took a bit of convincing, but we rolled out a couple of hives. Uh, we, yeah, so we rolled out Fitzroy Carlton and basically made an example of how it could work. <clears throat> and this is, it's an, this is an important, uh, important part of our journey as to how it actually got to where it is today. <clears throat> in terms of um, the modern world we live in with uh, occupational health and safety, regulations, um, risk assessments, permits, had we have been in that way of thinking and followed those normal protocols, we would probably still not be doing what we're doing today. And what we did, which was, which was you know, by chance, um, is we, we just did it. We just went out, we did it. We thought, we, we had a good idea of how it would work and we made an example for other people to look at as to how it could work. And an example so people couldn't as easily say no because it hadn't been done because we can say here is a perfect working model where there is no problem. Working <coughs> models, people became a little bit interested and then... Which brings us to... Yeah, brings us to chance. Is it by chance that we're here today? <laughs> So, I mean, obviously you guys can read it's a possibility of something happening and the occurrence of events in the absence of any obvious intention or cause. Our project grew really, really quickly um, and Rooftop Honey actually became bigger than the people itself. Um, to this day, we have a beekeeping mentor, but Matt and I still look after everything and um, the bees, including all the extraction, including all the jars that get labelled and all those little hand, the handwritten labels that are on all the jars, that's my writing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's one of those things that grew really, really quickly. And although um, we thought it would naturally sit with, when we first started, we thought it would naturally sit with the rooftop movement and green, green um, greening of the, of the city and spaces and stuff like that. And obviously naturally, because I like, <coughs> Gardening, I thought it would naturally go with these guys, but 
food culture really embraced us. And it wasn't, I mean, it kind of looks obvious, it seems quite obvious when you think about it in hindsight, but at the start, we actually didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't actually realise that that was the part of Melbourne that was really going to be, form our community and really embrace our project. Another thing, by chance, was timing with us. Um, worldwide, bees were declining and there was a lot of awareness happening in Europe and the US. Bits and pieces here, but not a hell of a lot. So I think the success of our project has also been with the timing of it. Um, we just happened to launch this at the right time and we were in the right place. We've also had lots of opportunities and I suppose you would say chances of meeting people that we would not normally or ever imagine that we would meet um, being here today, uh, for example. But we have also come across, like, in our journey of going around and meeting people to have a look at um, roof spaces as well as um, utilise courtyards and gardens and balconies, we've met a few interesting people and we actually didn't realise until after we met them who they were which was kind of a good thing for us because I suppose they just didn't see us of, oh, you're such and such Mr. Mr. Big Restaurant Round Town. Because um, Matt and I kindly went in fairly blindly and raving and carrying on about bees and how important that they were. We actually didn't even notice that we were talking to the likes of one day we were talking to Andrew McConnell. And we came home and we, for some reason, we flicked the television on and we saw an episode of, I think it was postcards or something. And we're, we're watching it and we go, hey, there's that guy that we saw on the, we saw at the restaurant the other day. Uh, it was Anthony Bourdain, that's yeah. it. Yeah. And so we're like, that's that guy who we saw the other day in the restaurant. Can you believe that? Oh my God, he's, up, he's actually, he's somebody. Who we didn't even realise. So by chance, you know, those, those kinds of situations have, have, have arisen. We've also had... Um, been on television on doing weather crosses and Coxie's big break and all sorts of things that you, we would never have imagined doing those kinds of things. So, you know, and I suppose it's all relating back to, to, to the topic today. It is by, and a lot of those things are just by chance. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I suppose it's, it's how to utilise those chances and, and see them for opportunities that they are. Including. Exactly. So, um, and and so you can see that well. Yeah. So basically, uh, back to to our bees more so, um, giving bees another chance, which is something that was important in our project. And, and as the as the attention grew with our project, it was embraced by the food culture of Melbourne. Uh, the Epicure from the age started writing about what we were doing, and from there on, it exploded. It was actually quite out of control uh, and, and we had to reassess what we were doing because at the start we thought it would be a hobby project, we'd have four or five hives around the city, every second weekend we'll duck in and have a little look at our bees and it's just going to be sort of something that we look after. We uh, instantly started forming a waiting list for bees. We still have that waiting list and we've never really made a dent in it and it just continues to spiral out of control where to the point to today, there's about 450 people on our waiting list. <coughs> we, being the two of us, we, we now realise that we definitely need some help on board. We, um, we're looking at, at the minutes of factory space and some things like that to help with that growth. And it's the, the Melbourne embracing what we do and that food culture of Melbourne, I think, which is what's helped. We've met with people from Brisbane, people from Sydney, some ladies from South Australia. Um, we, we, were, we were sent across to Perth to meet with a lady over there. All of those people to look at our project and model their own project off ours and wondering how, how it can work. And something that we had to learn along the way was implementing a financial model. It was after it grew quite quickly that we had to decide that this was going to be big and it was taking over our lives and that we would take the chance and become full-time beekeepers. This, uh, yeah, so IT fell to the side, Vanessa quit her job, 
to become a beekeeper. <laughs> and we had to seriously implement a, a financial model because that's not something that we had never thought of. And we weren't from a business background, so it was really, really difficult. And there's not, you, you, we couldn't go to the bee club and ask the elderly gentleman how to implement a business model into <laughs> what our idea was. And in fact, they laughed at us when we told them that we were thinking of doing this project because one of them had seen an article and brought it in and go, are you these guys? And <laughs> laughed at it, literally said that could never work and laughed at us. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> So, um, so yes, yeah, sitting down and working out a financial model took some time and we didn't get it right straight away at all. It was nowhere near it. We, we implemented a price which we thought businesses, we, we didn't want to charge individuals, we didn't want it to be unacceptably expensive and out of reach of anyone. We wanted any, anyone to be able to get involved. And after um, doing our first year's accounting, our accountant friend said, you guys, you need to think about what you're doing. <laughs> um, because this, this doesn't work. And so we, we have continued to adjust our pricing along the way. And yeah, we, we, some individuals um, do sponsor hives. We mainly focus on the businesses sponsoring. And at the moment, it is working. We've set it up where we try not to focus on honey at all. Our idea is for bees to, to, be, you know, to look after bees, to do the right thing by bees. And our general motto is that if the bees are happy and healthy, the honey will be a byproduct that comes along from that. So we never put expectations on honey production, and it's something we also had to learn along the way with the hosts. When we're assessing a site, we're also assessing the host and what their expectations are and why they want to be involved. And luckily, yeah, we, we, we are working with all the right people. I'm realising we're talking a little bit long. Yeah. But um, so yeah, we, we rehome bees. Basically, bees used to be seen as pests by local councils and exterminated. Through what we've been doing, we're, we're trying to educate the general public that the importance of bees and not just killing bees. We, we collect swarms and all of our hives on, in, in our project on our rooftops have all been populated by swarms that we collect. Not all of them are usable. Some of them are ferociously feral and aren't fit for hu public consumption. They end up going to a friend's site out in the country and he can deal with angry bees. We don't like them. <laughs> So each, each collection of a swarm or reha rehoming of a colony is quite unique and different. They're not always straightforward as you can kind of see. Some of these are natural outdoor combs. Um, <laughs> interesting plants like yuccas, they're kind of hard to get bees because they're kind of spiky. And there's, you know, as Matt was talking about, there's like climbing up ladders on fences and all sorts of carry-ons that go on. Here's some examples of some of the places where we've housed our bees as well over the years. Um, this one down here is one of our first uh, colonies that we put in Rankins Lane, which is just near the um, GPO. And there's a couple shots there from Fitzroy and West, um, West Melbourne, a couple in the city. But we've kind of moved that's across the road at the Alto Hotel. There's two hives that live there. There's also a hive, which is a surveillance hive that acts as, um, at, we inspect it and send off a little sticky mat for the Department of Primary Industries. Because um, security is a real issue when it comes to, well, I'll get to that very quickly. Um, when it comes to the ports, uh, a few more sponsors and things. Um, <coughs> This is some examples of some backyards where we've got some beehives just in some residential places as well as some more in the city. We've kind of upgraded ourselves of late. Um, we've moved along to the whole bee village thing. <laughs> it, makes our, it makes us more efficient and it also creates clusters. Um, so you can see there's a couple villages here. One of them's um, that's at Doncaster. That's at the jam factory down here in South Yarra. And of course, there's the iconic Federation Square Village, which everybody wants to know about. But access is really difficult. So it's like this secret, elusive place that everyone wants to see, but nobody's seen. <laughs> um, we've also moved on to a lot of workshops and are doing um, courses and things. And we also do mentoring sessions where people can come out with us and have a look at, at some beehives. And we show you a, different, a few different types. Back to be giving bees a chance, or us. So 
one of the reasons why we started this was one in three mouthfuls of food that we eat is somewhere reliant on bee pollination, be it albeit honeybee, native bees. Some people argue that it's two and three mouthfuls of food if you're looking at things like clover to feed uh, cattle and stuff like that as well. And in our country and as well as around the world, about 65% of our agricultural industries are reliant on honeybee pollination. For example, things like stone fruits, like cherries, almonds. If we didn't have honeybees, we would not have any of those beautiful things, fruits and nuts. You can read that, studies. <laughs> the studies have shown that urban bees are healthy bees. If you look at the way in which the industry has been in the past, a lot of beekeeping is migratory and following flowers. We don't like to, we like to keep our bees in one place and, and let them forage within the two to five kilometres from their hive. And as we discovered along the way, that each location has its unique flavour and it changes throughout the season. So we decided to keep them all separate, which was another thing that we kind of come across. Instead of just creating a Melbourne honey, we created, you know, you've got Burke Street, Flinders Lane, that kind of thing, as well as suburbs. But what we can do to all help. Obviously, because I'm a gardener, I love planting plants. So be, plant as many bee-friendly plants that you can. If you can't support a beekeeper or a beehive or you don't like honey, you can at least plant some stuff for them. Even if you've got just a small balcony or a, you know, a little potted plant on a windowsill, it all goes towards helping our pollinators. There's a few peti petitions going around, international petitions from a vase about the US and EU stopping the neonicotinoid pesticides. Um, the EU have banned, put a two-year ban. There is lots of talk in Australia that we don't have those issues here. We do have those issues. It's just that we don't have the, I suppose, what you would say, the intensity of the... Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> you want to talk about that study? Because I don't re recall what you're talking about right now. <laughs> right, so yeah, it's a preliminary study um, that, um, that, that should be quite quite public soon. But uh, basically, they were, they're looking at, they've always argued in Australia, we don't have any of the problems they have in the rest of the world. We don't use pesticides so heavily and we don't have such a large monoculture as things like in the US. Uh, and we don't have the varroa mite. That's always been their argument that our bees are healthy and there's no problem anyway. A study just coming out um, a couple of days ago has shown that there is actually a really noticeable decline in bees in Australia, which is alarming because it's it's ah, it's, it's always been yeah. denied. <laughs> I have to say, I haven't read the report. Yeah, we haven't read the actual report. We've read the preliminary report, but uh, waiting for the actual one to come out. Yeah, so there was a, a new study, and yes, there is a decline in bees, which is alarming because we don't have varroa mite. We don't use like as many, anywhere near as, as many as the neonicotinoid pesticides that are being used. So for this to come out and to find this is actually very alarming because we, we then have to start looking at other reasons as to, to what's going on with the bees and my guess is it's humans. Okay, um, obviously going back to not using pesticides and herbicides in your garden, um, there are some really big name brands out there that are really harmful for bees and actual in actual fact, any pollinators and insects. Um, yes, like all sorts of aphid treatments and things for your roses, but I'm not mentioning names, you can work that one out. Um, join local initiatives helping their colonies. Some really good movies out there and documentaries. Queen of the Sun, um, there's More Than Honey, which is probably the most recent one, and it's also a, it's a Swiss, a Swiss, a yeah, Swiss, German Swiss German documentary, but it also actually comes to Australia as well and goes to visit the guys over in WA at Cyber, at the University of Western Australia, who are doing some wonderful bee research. Um, and obviously, like, become involved, support local beekeepers, or go and buy your honey from farmers markets, those kinds of things. Don't, I won't tell you not, not to buy supermarket honey, but where possible, try and buy raw honey try and buy honey that hasn't been pasteurised or ultra um, filtered because, yeah, because basically they are the, they're the things, you want honey to crystallise, real honey does crystallise during the cooler months and there's no point in eating honey if you're just eating sugar. You might as well have some nutritional value and microbial and antifungal and all that kind of 
wonderful stuff that we love honey for. And thanks for coming. <laughs>